Okay, well, I think we'll um, get started. So I, um, I believe this is being recorded. I, I'll let Alexa, yeah, <laughs> she's nodding at me. Um, but welcome to the session for civil engineering for Gonzaga University. So we'll go to the introductions. So I am Rhonda Young. So I'm a faculty member here in the department. Um, uh, civil engineers talk a lot about subdisciplines in their area within civil engineering. I happen to be um, uh, in the transportation field. So wrapping up my fifth year here at Gonzaga. So prior to coming to Gonzaga, um, I was a practicing engineer for about 10 years and then also ran a graduate program and a research program at another institution and became sort of increasingly aware of the importance of an undergraduate education in engineering um, and in the foundation of creating engineers that sort of serve society. So I was fortunate enough to be able to come to Gonzaga and as I said, five years and um, couldn't ask you know, for a better job. Hi everyone, I'm Mark Mazinski. I've been at Gonzaga for eight years now and I'm in the geotechnical as well as structural and, and construction areas. Um, I worked in practice for about eight years before going back to school for my PhD. I'm from the Midwest originally, Michigan. Um, and I'll share a fun fact with you. I had no idea I could grow a beard before I tried. <laughs> I was working in the lab for about three nights straight, it seems like, during my PhD, and someone commented, hey, you look good in that. And I said, in what? You're growing a beard, right? So I had no idea, and it's uh, been with me ever since. I should trim it, though, I think. <laughs> uh, hello, I'm Kyle Shimabuku. So uh, I'm just completing my first year here at Gonzaga. Uh, before this, I was working as a consulting engine engineer, working on water treatment plants and wastewater treatment plants in the Bay Area and in Colorado. And then um, before then, I completed my PhD at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, and then before that, um, I did some uh, uh, work abroad in, in Africa, working on some uh, water projects in remote regions. Um, and then I also worked for the city of Ventura, where I'm initially from um, in Ventura, California. And maybe the, the one kind of fun fact I'll share is that, um, well, I'll go ahead and just say Rhonda's fun fact that she at least used to ski 200 days a year and, and would still like to. Um, uh, and then my, my fun fact is um, I, I really enjoy um, uh, rivers um, and river rafting <clears throat> and my wife does as well. And we, we named our son Rivers uh, in part because of that. Um, and, um, and yeah, the, the, this last thing I'll just mention too, yeah, you know, the Gonzaga, you know, it's my first year here. And so I, um, I was in somewhat of a similar position to you all of uh, searching out, um, what the university was all about. Um, and the, the fact that, uh, it's a hum uh, an institution that's focused on um, serving society and developing the whole person uh, of students that come to, to you is really what attracted me. And uh, when I interviewed, um, I thought, wow, they, they really are following through on that, um, connecting with students. Um, and then having completed my first year, I, you know, I found um, that, yeah, it's no joke that they take very seriously developing the whole person and, and, and really ensuring not, you know, you're not only um, academically prepared, but emotionally, spiritually, et cetera prepared to, to take that next step, so. All right. So lots of words on this uh, slide, but um, uh, Gonzaga is an accredited engineering program. And so these, uh, this first bullet is our, what we call our program objectives. So this is our hopes and dreams for our students at time of graduation. And so like many programs, they talk about, you know, being able to be an engineer and uh, be technically competent. Um, also within civil engineering, it's quite important that uh, you work within teams and show leadership and, and sort of this service to, um, to others. But the, the last bullet is kind of what um, Kyle was talking about, is that we're not just an engineering school that happens to be within a Jesuit institution, but we are an engineering program that is fully integrated and with the, the broader mission of the university. 
And to add to that, to the, well, about the why question down below, one of my favorite aspects of civil engineering is that we tend to directly serve the public and society uh, more so than other branches of engineering. Not that uh, every branch isn't uh, important, but I like the fact that we, we tend to uh, serve the public directly and we tend to work on the types of things that we tend to take for granted in society. And those are uh, comfortable buildings, uh, good, uh, good roads to drive on, uh, clean water, and things like that. And so uh, sometimes uh, we don't think about it, but that's part of the, the excitement I get out of civil engineering, knowing that I'm involved in that. So on the, um, I just want to point out the pictures on the side. So um, they're of the Herrick Center for Engineering and um, attached to it is the Packer Center for Applied Science. So these are the two buildings that are connected where um, our labs, our computer labs, our faculty offices, and, and most of our classrooms are. And, um, and so what we're seeing here now on this slide that you maybe heard a little bit about is the uh, an artist rendering here on the bottom right uh, of the future uh, uh, integrated science and engineering building or ISE um, and here you can actually see um, it's being or the foundation and all kind of the, the geotechnical engineering is being uh, implemented right now um, since the building is anticipated to come online um, uh, fall of 2021 um, so it's well underway right now. Um, and so that's exciting um, that uh, civil engineering will have um, a space in this building to be able to interact uh, more broadly uh, across the university with other disciplines. Um, so, so real quick, just a few highlights about civil engineering program at Gonzaga. So uh, we represent all five major sub-disciplines of civil engineering, environmental, geotech, structures, transportation, and water resources engineering. Um, we're also a program that's um, uh, active in offering study abroad opportunities. Um, and like I mentioned, that was apparent to me just when I interviewed here and, and in my first years, just the strong relationships between students and the faculty. Um, I can remember when I interviewed and had lunch with uh, Dr. Mazinski and Dr. Schultz, who's not on this call, that the students and them were just joking around a lot and making uh, fun um, digs at each other. And um, so, yes, I, I was excited to be a part of a, a, a culture where uh, you can have this kind of close congenial relationship with students. Um, and then I'll just also point out um, our, our faculty, um, uh, many of us um, are active in research and, and also active um, practicing engineers as, uh, as consultants. So you get a broad exposure to faculty who aren't just doing research like at many institutions. Um, and uh, like we've pointed out a couple times, you know, our program is, is grounded in the Gonzaga mission. We take that mission seriously. Um, and then some of the important highlights as well of how well we've prepared our students or we feel like it shows that we've prepared our students well is that um, 90 per, over 90% of the students have internships prior to graduation. Um, 95 or greater than 95% of students have employment or graduate school placement after graduating. Um, and then we have uh, very high success rates as well on the fundamentals of engineering exam. Okay, so I'll, I'll just do a quick overview of what uh, environmental engineering um, looks like um, at Gonzaga just a little bit. And so uh, one of the things that we cover in environmental engineering courses, which is my uh, um, area of emphasis, is kind of the more historical uh, roots of environmental engineering that look at how you uh, uh, treat water, treat wastewater, the waste that we produce, and then also how we can kind of engineer and work with the natural environment to uh, protect public health uh, and as well as environmental resources. Um, and uh, just as an example, these kind of three different uh, sub uh, topics within environmental engineering work together to be able to protect public health. And so just an example of uh, of why this work is really important is 
Um, back in the early 90s, there was a large uh, waterborne disease outbreak that sickened over 400,000 people and killed uh, over 100. Um, and it was really a breakdown of all three of these systems, the drinking water, wastewater, and engineered wetlands um, weren't uh, operating as they needed to be. And so this is why this work is so important as environmental engineers, because um, the work we do directly impacts public health. Um, and in environmental engineering, um, it's uh, it's growing beyond kind of the historical roots of the discipline, um, and looking at how we can develop more sustainable systems by recovering environmental resources. So, for instance, looking at how uh, we can actually take the water that we would use from a drinking water treatment plant and send to a wastewater treatment plant, how we can divert that water back to a drinking water treatment plant and effectively reuse the water which is a resource, uh, as well as um, energy and fertilizer are increasingly being harvested from wastewater treatment plants. Um, and then also trying to ensure that our um, industries are operating in a more sustainable fashion by limiting the amount of uh, greenhouse gases um, that they're emitting to the environment as well. So one of my areas of specialty, the primary area is my uh, geotechnical specialty. And when you see the word geotechnical, you see geo that has to do with the earth. And we're talking about different ground conditions uh, for the most part in the lower left-hand corner, the colorful map of a portion of the United States, for example, shows different types of bedrock. And so there are a lot of different types of bedrock. They all have different properties. Uh, different amounts of load to be placed on them uh, before they break. In some areas of the United States, many areas, that bedrock is overlain by different types of soil. And that soil also has very interesting and unique properties too. Some of the soil can be very soft, like organic soil, such as uh, peat and lake marl and certain uh, bog soils. And so you can imagine those types of soils can't necessarily support a lot of load. There are other soils that are much more able to support loads, um, various sands and gravels that are compact. And so that leads to different types of foundation systems that civil engineers consider for support of uh, structures. So the upper right hand photo shows some spread footings that's actually of a parking deck. The columns come down and the big spread footings uh, spread out that load over a bigger area of ground. And the bottom uh, right-hand corner are pile foundations. And so those are 60-foot long piles that go through some very soft soil and down to some more uh, competent soil below to support the building. Go ahead with the next slide, Kat. Now for structures, I would argue, it's my opinion that uh, it may be one of the most recognizable branches of civil engineering. And it's because uh, obviously we all see the structure above the ground. Uh, these structures are important to us. We live in them, we work in them, we drive on them and over them. And so when we're talking about structural design, we have to think about the different loadings on buildings, the, the weights of the buildings themselves, the wind loads, earthquake loads, and things like that. And so it becomes a, a really interesting exercise in determining what the configuration of the building should be and what the materials used should be for those types of structures. Uh, and that's the long and short of structural engineering. Just like any other branch, it can really get into it, as you would see. So my area is transportation. I think most people is building roads and that certainly falls within this discipline. But it's also thinking about how the transportation system can handle current, um, current and future growth. So what it'll look like in 10 years and 15 years and 20 years. And increasingly it's about how to efficiently operate the facilities. So um, it's an exciting time to be a transportation engineer. There's so much um, new technology and thinking about not just vehicle technology, but sensing technology and how we can try to operate our roads so that they're safer um, and that they have less environmental impact. So um, it's, it, it feels the whole sort of gamut um, from statistical modeling to, you know, how you design a road curve.
And then for uh, water resources engineering, um, you know, uh, it focuses a, a major uh, branch of it is on just supplying water for different beneficial purposes. Um, and typically how water resources engineers do this is by storing water um, as well as like in, um, in dams and uh, using dams uh, to store water in reservoirs, but also um, moving water. So this is just showing an engineered uh, channel on a river. You can see a lot of people are very excited about the civil engineering project, and that's why they're lined up along the side of the channel. So no, they're actually there to watch these surfers surfing on the channel. So that's a one uh, fun part of civil engineering or water resources is that you also engineer systems for recreation, like surfing on a river. Um, uh, the field also interacts with energy generation through um, hydropower. Um, and then another important area is just controlling water, so preventing things like floods so that we can prevent our infrastructure. Also pro uh, protecting aquatic ecosystems. So you can see uh, one uh, branch of this river is experiencing a lot of erosion. So we're interested in preventing things like that. One way that uh, one of our faculty members um, tries to uh, restore rivers and limit erosion is by using things like beaver dams. So promoting beavers to uh, place dams along a stream to limit the amount of, of sedimentation or sediments that can move through the river. Um, and, and the discipline really relies on hydrology. So understanding the kind of the interactions between rainfall and geography or topography and how water will move in a natural environment, but then also hydraulics as well, which is basically um, speaking to fluid mechanics. So you know, why does the river flow kind of flat and then uh, jump up and, and experience something called the hydraulic jump that you're seeing here that allows this wave to be formed. So now um, a little bit more about kind of the nuts and bolts of our program. And so one of the things I think that is uh, unique and um, a selling point for our um, is our curriculum. So we have uh, a common first year experience. So um, we have a six credit, two semester sequence of courses. Uh, we call it NSC 191 and 192. Um, so three credits each semester. And um, it provides uh, foundational engineering um, skills, but also just more information about the different engineering disciplines. And these are shared across um, the different programs that we have here. And um, it also allows students to explore. So um, while we all hope that you become civil engineers, um, it, we do, by having a common first year, we do allow our students to sort of explore those disciplines so that they can feel really um, confident in their, uh, the choice that they go into without having any impacts and still able to maintain that four years to graduation. And so these uh, first year experience um, classes have um, lots of, you know, sort of content to them, but they're also very hands-on. And so um, in addition to just learning programming, you're actually programming uh, robots that um, implement the code that you've just used. So trying to have a lot of feedback and, and try to create a, a sense of um, sort of excitement about what the engineering profession can um, sort of opens up for you. Well, there's no shortage of of uh, activities, extracurricular activities you can become involved with. These are some of the various clubs in uh, that are related to civil engineering, the ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineers, Steel Bridge, Concrete Canoe, the Institute of Transportation Engineers is uh, quite active in doing a number of things. Other specialized or uh, different types of uh, clubs and societies, Society of Women's Engineers, uh, Zags Without Borders, where they um, concentrate on matters beyond our own borders, as the name would imply, the Sustainability Club. There's also a number of different university uh, student clubs as well. The photos down below show a number of uh, different activities. That's Dr. Sue Nisgoda. She goes by Dr. Sue in the left, lower left corner there. And um, Dr. Young, I forget, what is she doing there? She's um, at uh, one of the elementary schools. So the ASCE club does, I think, four or five STEM nights at local elementary school. And so we have a bunch of hands-on civil engineering um, activities we, we do with the students. Okay, sure. Yeah, we do a number of those. I've done those as well. The next one over is an uh, image of a steel bridge in one of the years. And then there's the concrete canoe. 
Uh, we do a number of uh, activities like uh, volleyball, bowling nights, things like that. And then the last one over, you might have to help me with that one as well, again. So that's the ITE Student Club. And so they're working with a council member here in Spokane who wanted to test a new kind of bike facility. So a higher sort of protected bike facility. And so we tested it out. So we're using cornstarch paint and we did a pilot and tested, um, collected uh, traffic data and also user data about how people felt about their level of stress or comfort on this new type of bike facility, so. I'd say that the, the other nice thing about those clubs is that they also complement civil engineering and uh, there are plenty of clubs to sort of suit your own interests too within civil engineering as well. Um, <clears throat> so we also, uh, as faculty, are active uh, in research um, and this is something that uh, uh, it is exciting to do at Gonzaga because we really get to focus on research opportunities for undergraduate students. Um, I know that during uh, my PhD that uh, other uh, more research focused universities, the, the focus uh, uh, is more on the graduate students doing the research, but at Gonzaga where we're a primarily undergraduate institution, um, we get to uh, offer those kind of first time research experiences very early on. Um, and so, you know, one of the reasons why I like this is it allows you to get that hands-on experience very early on in your studies. Um, and so this can be done, you know, over the summer, but also during the school year um, at, at kind of any uh, level, whether you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Um, and then, you know, our, our favorite thing about it is just being able to get to know many of you um, um, more on a one-on-one -on -one basis and being able to work directly with each other. Um, and then one of the great things uh, as well about <clears throat> these types of experiences is that they can offer opportunities uh, to publish. And so this is an example of a, of a peer reviewed article um, that was uh, led by Dr. Uh, Schultz. And that also included an undergraduate student who was a co-author on it. And so that's something that can really help boost uh, graduate school applications if that's of interest to you. Um, and then here is a, a photo of a student <clears throat> um, working on um, in a fume hood. And one of the, the neat things just about this photo was the this, this student um, couldn't find a, a certain type of fume hood that he needed um, in engineering. And so uh, we reached out uh, to a professor in chemistry and he quickly responded um, and just kind of demonstrates how collaborative I think the atmosphere is at at Gonzaga and even uh, other departments, uh, you know, across the university and in other colleges are, are really uh, willing to support undergraduate research. And then I'll just point out to you, this picture here is showing a drone that Dr. Suni Zgoda uses in her research. And you can see one of the students flying that drone to take aerial shots um, of, of a stream uh, and riparian environment. One of the strengths um, as Gonzaga, for Gonzaga as a whole is a, a focus and lots of opportunities for study abroad. Um, this is something that's pretty rare for um, to be able for engineering students to engage in, but um, the commitment of the university has led to a commitment within engineering. So um, there are several academic semesters. So these are um, semesters, uh, typically the second semester of your sophomore year. Um, the Gonzaga and Florence program is an actual um, campus in Florence that Gonzaga operates that you um, can take your engineering classes there. But we also have partnerships um, with the University of Auckland and another in Madrid. And so those are the three programs that you see um, students, engineering students, um, be involved with. And then um, within civil engineering, we're um, the first sort of uh, engineering program to do a faculty-led engineering um, program. And so every other summer, we take a group of Gonzaga students um, to the Netherlands, and we look at uh, sustainable cities. So food production, energy use, certainly transportation. We spend a lot of time on a bike. Um, and, uh, you know, building in all aspects of civil engineering and we just look at these things in practice and then spend time uh, looking at how um, we can bring some of these practices back to our own communities. So doing case studies. 
as part of our civil engineering curriculum and actually all the other curricula as well, uh, there's the university core. And so this consists of collectively a number of courses uh, in some of these categories. This graphic shows one, two, three, and four the, each year. And the second column over, uh, for example, number one, how do we pursue knowledge and cultivate understanding uh, kind of gives a theme for the courses that are um, involved in the first year. Uh, and it starts out with a, with a, a wide breadth at first, and then it sort of uh, not necessarily specializes, but it targets in on some other things as you approach year four. Uh, these courses, uh, for example, Philosophy 101, you often have your choice of um, core classes that you take. Uh, if there is a class that's required, you have uh, choices of uh, instructors. Each of those instructors often have different flavors of courses that they offer. Uh, one of my, one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Paul Nowak, I think said it best one time when he described it to me like, uh, what did he say? He said, uh, the core is the glue that holds the technical aspects of your uh, degree together. And I really believe that I'm a big fan of the core in that way. It does really help you. Uh, it's, a, it's a really nice complement to the technical part of the curriculum. Uh, I mean, I'll just tack on there as well that um, some of these designators and some of the core um, objectives are incorporated into um, some of the, the classes that you'll be taking part of your civil engineering curriculum. Um, um, like writing enriched courses are part of uh, some of our civil engineering courses since there's a technical writing component of them. Um, for uh, our curriculum, um, like was highlighted earlier, we start out uh, with a broader uh, foundation in, in engineering, um, touching uh, many different disciplines even outside of civil engineering. Um, and then we move into more civil engineering foundation courses, uh, like fluid mechanics or geomatics, um, that then uh, prepare you to then move into that next uh, level of, of breadth civil engineering where you're a little bit more focused taking classes like on hydrology or um, uh, uh, structural analysis. Um, and then in that fourth and final year, that's where you're able to really specialize on maybe a topic that interests you, t you the most or a track that interests you the most. So for instance, if you're interested in environmental engineering, or structures in geotech, you can take up to five or five to seven different elective courses so that you can specialize. But at the same time, if you wanna stay broad and take electives in many of these different areas, you're certainly welcome to do so. Um, and I'd say that you know one of the things that really holds um, this whole curriculum together is that uh, is kind of the ultimate goal or objective, which is to provide a safe and sustainable infrastructure and a safe and a sustainable future for, for society. So um, we mentioned at the beginning that you have um, six credits that you take your freshman year. And so the other, the other bookend to that is your senior year is working on a senior design project. So you have a year, a full academic year where you're working in small teams, which is really unusual if you look at other civil engineering programs that we, um, we, create a lot of projects. We work with public and private agencies. And then at the very beginning of your senior year, you get to um, sort of vote on your preference and you get put on um, teams usually of about four students and you get to work with those um, outside clients for the academic year on real projects. And some, sometimes things that even get implemented, I worked um, with a group of students who we developed a, um, a neighborhood greenway, which is like a bike boulevard and secure, worked, the city secured funding, um, over a million dollars of funding, and that is um, actually getting built this summer and it runs right through campus. So um, we try to engage our um, students in things that aren't just um, in the book, but actually real. So um, there's also an opportunity where we work with students in the business school to develop their own projects in their junior year um, if they're interested in, in something um, very specific or also interested in sort of the entrepreneurial side of engineering. Um, they can, um, through their junior year, develop that project, and then that becomes their senior design project um, that last year. So, so 
uh, as faculty, we also serve as your advisor too. You'll be uh, assigned an, an advisor and uh, usually that advisor aligns well with your uh, interests. You can always change, but one of the favorite parts of being an advisor is helping my students uh, navigate this, these choices of what to do after uh, graduation. And so there are a number of different things you can do. First, there's uh, employment. It's good to be employed, I guess, sometimes. And uh, there are a lot of options when it comes to employment, civil engineering, private practice, uh, the public sector. Uh, and so we can, I'd like to help my students navigate those options. Some students are interested in grad school, which we also help with. We can, um, it was, as you imagine, there's a lot of questions in revolving around grad school. There's other uh, things you can do when you graduate. Uh, some uh, nonprofit types of activities, uh, Peace Corps or others. Uh, actually, some nonprofit organizations are actually paid positions too, so it's not all volunteer work. Some, some of it might be volunteer work, but uh, I think we've had students that have done a number of different things. In the photos here, we've got uh, Nate, Ashley, and John. And Nate on the left side actually just graduated a, a couple of short years ago, it seems like, because he did, I think. And here he is uh, running a project. And Dr. Young, what project was this again? This was the Catalyst Building. So it's the most energy efficient building um, in the state of Washington that's being built right next to campus. So that's pretty remarkable that Nate is already in that kind of a position. Uh, civil engineering and engineering in general is a, a really versatile uh, degree. You might find yourself doing a number of things. Ashley uh, in the center uh, was, uh, I think she's at grad school at the University of South Florida right now, and I think she's doing some great things. Um, Looking at the safe drinking water in developing countries. Okay, and then John on the right side there is a bridge engineer, I understand, and he's also um, giving back to Gonzaga in, in some big ways already, even being a relatively recent graduate. Um, and so we'll uh, finish up here talking a little bit more about our facilities uh, and lab spaces. So here's a few pictures uh, taken of uh, our water resources lab. So this is a, a flume, I believe it's called. Um, here's our environmental engineering lab. We're running experiments, uh, uh, water quality uh, focused experiments. Here's uh, Dr. Schultz uh, in a structural or construction materials laboratory course. And then this is uh, Dr. Uh, Young's um, simulator. I'll let her talk about that for a second. So the student is, is uh, experiencing what it's like to ride um, the streets of Copenhagen at rush hour. So looking at what bicycle facilities can be, things that we can't experience here, so. And, so, and I'll just uh, say too that uh, uh, many of these labs are performed um, in your junior year where you're doing a lot of the breath uh, work of civil engineering. Um, uh, and so, Oh, these labs are, you know, while you're getting a lot of theory, you're, we're also trying to give that hands-on experience um, uh, in, in the lab as well. So civil engineering isn't just about being in the lab. So we have, we have good labs. We're about to have much better labs with the um, uh, ISE building coming online in 15 months. Um, but a big piece of uh, civil engineering is using the city as our lab. So because our, our faculty are professionally engaged, we have a lot of contacts in the community. So we have um, relationships with property owners that let um, Dr. Sue do stream restoration on their property and building of uh, simulated beaver dams. Um, we're out there um, working with the city on testing out different bike facilities um, and going and seeing buildings in construction and and taking students. And so a lot of these field trips um, begin really early on, but we want um, to use our, our city as our lab. So Spokane as a city of about 350,000 and a metro area of half a million, it's big, but not too big. So we have a lot of um, companies here that we work with. Um, so building uh, what's called 
cross laminated timber, what we see in the middle is a way of being able to build higher rise buildings out of timber, which is pretty um, unique. And so they're, they're manufacturing that here in town. And so just trying to get our students out in the city and in, the, in nature experiencing these things and not just only in the lab. So we talked fast. <laughs> We wanted to point out, so there were three of our faculty were here today, but some of their, I think they all would have been here. We were worried about the logistics of bringing it all. They um, are always super excited. Um, you can find everybody's contact information on the website, including ours, if you wanted, um, if you had questions. Um, you can unmute yourself and ask questions. You can type. Yeah, so um, everyone feel free to put those questions in the chat, but to get us started, we do have some questions that students submitted as they registered for the event. So if you guys are okay, I can kind of start listening out some of those. Um, and then as Dr. Young said, if you students or parents have any questions, you can put them in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, but a very common question is, um, what core requirements are met with certain engineering classes? Okay, well, um, so uh, I think that the core on its own um, would be 45 cre semester credit hours, um, and we, 15 of those we have embedded within our um, engineering classes. So some common ones are that, that first year sequence I talked about that um, uh, covers the uh, English class and first year seminar class. We also embed some communication requirements. We think it's important for civil engineers to be able to communicate about. We're so such a public facing part of engineering that being able to explain technical subjects to non-technical audiences is important. So we've embedded that. Um, and then there's some writing and at the end um, and some designators. So about 15 of those credits are taken care of within our engineering program. Awesome. So this student says that they are interested in both mechanical and civil engineering. How reasonable is it to double major in two engineering fields? Anybody? I don't think we've had anyone attempt that. It would be hard. So um, our curriculum is, we just made a change and it's 130 credit hours. Um, mechanical is, is much higher than ours, and uh, off the top of my head, I want to say that they're in the high 30s, 130s, so maybe even approaching 140. Um, and what is shared would probably be, I mean, obviously the, the core and some engineering science. I, if I had to, off the top of my head, I'd say that at most 45 credit hours would be shared. So About the first two years or so. Yeah, maybe two years. Common. So I bet it would be um, a two additional years. Now, you know, with summer classes and stuff, there might be some way. Um, some of our course, our structural courses are allowed as technical electives um, and mechanical. So there's, I guess, some additional, I think, two more classes, but um, I couldn't see a way that it would be less than at least a year and a half and, and possibly um, four full semesters to double major. It's, it would be challenging. Great. And then our first question coming in from the chat, so yay. Um, what is it, any advice that you can give students on how to better prepare for their engineering courses during quarantine? Um, <laughs> Math <laughs> is all that, you know, I'm, the, the, the most critical thing is math readiness. And so um, depending on where you're coming out of high school, um, I know uh, some of our students come in with AP and other don't. I know there's a, a math readiness that sort of does your placement, but um, that is the most sort of critical path through to so math readiness. Um, there's a lot of fun kind of programming things um, that certainly would help in the first year as well. Um, but really it's just a, a sense of, I think the more you're sort of motivated by what an engineering degree can do, like what, what's behind the reason for it, then, you know, so just that sense of like wonder and, and enthusiasm for the profession is, is just a big one because um, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, there's homework. 
<laughs> so the more the more interested you're in the subject to where you see what it's all for the the better right to put it well come at it from a slightly different angle but sort of uh dovetail what dr young said i'd probably take the time right now to probably explore the different options in engineering more than the specific uh, types of things you'll learn in the first year that might be time well spent just making sure that you're in the type of engineering that you will really enjoy it that's to me important um, you'll be doing it for the rest of your life so you definitely don't want to skimp on your research when it comes to that awesome next question um, oh. Oh, and i'll just kind of continue on with what <laughs> Uh, Dr. Mazinski said too that, um, yeah, I, I think really, and what, what Dr. Young said of, of um, finding what it is about your dis engineering discipline, hopefully it's civil, that makes you most excited. Um, and, you know, when, when you get here, um, you know, that excitement will be able to carry you through any, um, you know, maybe any deficiencies you may have had from, uh, uh, you know, not getting as much math maybe as you would have liked, things like that. I mean, I, I feel like there's an incredible support system here at GU. Um, you know, whether it's being able to just interact with faculty uh, very frequently or getting tutoring help, things like that. So as long as you're, you're motivated, um, uh, you'll have the support you need to be successful. Awesome, so we have about three minutes left till, um, five o'clock, so if any of the students have any other questions that they'd like to ask, please put them in the chat now. Um, but another one that was submitted through our registration process is, in the event of school closure due to COVID-19, how will classes be conducted, specifically labs? So I'll start and then um, I'll let Dr. Shimabuku um, end, because, um, yeah, so, yeah, it, it was an interesting time. I would say what it was, I was so pleased to be at an institution like Gonzaga when it happened because we're a faculty that are incredibly close. And so we had lots of sessions where we were learning from each other and I almost took it on as an engineering uh, program. We also are really close to our students, so that served us well and that we had strong relationships with them so we could maintain that through online learning. Um, but we, we learned a lot. We, the institution and our department really does hope that we are in person at least at in at some level um and oh, but um we learned a lot and we are still learning from each other um but dr shimabuku um, had a lab last semester and i'll let him talk about um his approach to kind of keeping that going so yeah, just kind of continuing what Dr. Young said, I think one of the good things is that we at least got half a semester to know what it's like to do a lab remotely. Um, and so we'll be able to take that a uh, little bit of experience we had into the fall if by, by chance we needed to be able to do the lab um, remotely. So I feel like we're already a little bit, or we are a lot more prepared, you know, than we were halfway through last semester. Um, you know, really quick, something that I know Dr. Musgoda did is she, uh, had students actually still conduct some of the uh, experiments that she did for, I, I believe, a fluid mechanics related lab or hydraulics lab, mm -hmm. um, where students were able to kind of look at infiltration, do their own infiltration uh, tests in the soil where they were living, um, even kind of do tracer tests, seeing how fast water was uh, flowing down uh, a nearby uh, uh, stream by, by throwing kind of like a floating object and then timing how long it took to move down the stream and, and be able to generate that own data themselves. But um, uh, when it was uh, tough to do something that you couldn't just do wherever you were living, um, like for one of my labs, I recorded a lab a demonstration here at GU and then provided the data um, from that lab. Um, and so it still gives students a, a little bit of a hands-on experience of what it would look like to do that, at least at, at GU, how to do some types of tests that we had available. And then also, you know, the most critical part is really learning how to work with the data, analyze it and communicate it in written form. And so that was an, uh, you know, an experience that wasn't uh, lost at all. Having to do that remotely is, you know, really only kind of that hands-on work. Um, and then I also was able to design a, a lab as well, 
looking using data from other studies on um, how long uh, coronavirus uh, might uh, exist in indoor uh, air, uh, indoor environments, and so it was kind of using other people's laboratory data to then generate kind of new information and, and new data, which is an important skill and one that can be done remotely. Awesome. Well, it is five o'clock, so students and families, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think we can say we'll maybe hang out for one or two more minutes for any last minute questions, um, but any last remarks from our faculty? Well, hopefully our enthusiasm for, <laughs> for Gonzaga has uh, come across because it's, it's certainly not lacking, so. Please don't feel afraid to get in touch with us by email. Please don't hesitate. Yes, exactly. No questions whatsoever. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sorry to cut you off. Um, yeah, yeah, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to talk by phone too, if you prefer to do that, or even uh, you know, video chat, just like we are right now. Awesome, thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your night. Um, thank you especially to our faculty for joining us and providing all of that information and ask, or answering some of those really great questions from our students. Thank you. And good luck, everyone.